a cocky and controversial player with the reputation of a gunner, World B. Free would collect numerous nicknames over the course of his basketball career. The Brownsville Bomber, Instant Offense, All World, and with his leaping ability, he was aptly named. Lloyd Free grew up in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn, New York. Living in his parents' three-bedroom walk-up apartment, Lloyd and his eight brothers and sisters often huddled close to the stove, the building's only source of heat. Free grew up knowing he had to escape the poverty of his youth. He thought of becoming a boxer like his father. He also entertained the prospect of becoming a motorcycle rider. But basketball was the neighborhood sport. I was a terrible player as a kid, Free said. Could jump through the roof, could run, could do nothing else. Couldn't dribble with a damn. Free would meet a coach named Gil Reynolds at the neighborhood rec center who saw something in him. Reynolds would teach Free everything he knew about basketball, and the 14-year-old applied those lessons while playing at 66 Park. Free went up against the likes of Phil Sellers and Fly Williams, practicing by dunking beer cans through the bent metal rims at the playground. Free often played 12 hours a day as in Brooklyn. There was little else for a teenager to do that was legal. The hours of practice allowed him to add different nuances to his game. As the left-hander switched to shooting with his right because he felt it gave him a stronger move to the basket. At the age of 15, he completed a 360 degree spinning dunk on the Brooklyn playground much to the disbelief of bystanders. Everyone started shouting, World, World, Free said, like the world spinning. The nickname would stick. As he entered his teens, Free's mother didn't want him to go to Jefferson High, the troubled school where all of his friends were. Instead, she sent him to Canarsie High School in Brooklyn. Every morning, Free would hitchhike or jump the toll gate and take the subway to school. Free had never known a white kid until he attended Canarsie. Free had raw talent, but didn't make the varsity team until his junior year. By his senior year, he would average 29 points a game, leading the team to a 24-0 record and winning the city championship. But before college recruiters began wooing Free, he was being recruited by a different organization. Two rival street gangs, the Tomahawks and the Undertakers, wanted Free to join their ranks. I got to be good at basketball, Free said. They started knowing my name. The gangs wanted me, you know? Got real popular then, but I got out of that scene quick. Despite his cocky reputation, Free claimed that he didn't have all that much confidence in his ability while in high school and college. But once the scouts and agents started coming around, he began to believe in himself. He was a real quiet guy, Free's friend Greg Jackson said. He was shy. He never trusted people. It was just the neighborhood that we came from. There were very few people you could trust. But if you played basketball, you were respected. You didn't have to worry about being jumped or mugged. Now seen as a guard with some college star potential, Free was heavily recruited by Arkansas and Long Beach State's coach, Jerry Tarkanian. Free signed a letter of intent with Tarkanian but then reneged when Tarkanian took the coaching job at UNLV. Free then turned to Arkansas but his scores on the college exams were too low for Division I. A deal was worked out for him to take summer classes but Free left after only two weeks. Now taking advice from friend Greg Jackson, Free was convinced to sign with Guilford, a small college in North Carolina, selling himself on the thought of being the biggest fish in a small pond. Upon Free's arrival, Guilford's coach Jack Jensen took him into the dressing room and told him there was no guarantee he would start. Free busted out laughing. The young player arrived on campus looking different by design. He wore one black shoe and one white shoe in practice. He then led the Guilford Quakers to the championship in the NAIA tournament. Free would be the first freshman to win the Chuck Taylor Award as the most valuable player in the tournament as well as making the Quakers 
the first unseeded club to win the tourney. Guilford's coach Jack Jensen raved about Free's performance. Lloyd Free, Jensen asked, I can't teach Free anything more about basketball. He already knows more than I'll ever know. Jensen encouraged Free to forego his senior season and go hardship into the draft if the money was there. Free now regretted that he had not gone to a bigger school as this would have gotten him more leverage in the pros. The St. Louis Spirits would draft him in the first round of the ABA, but Jack McMahon, the Philadelphia 76ers director of player personnel, watched Free play in back-to-back -back games. I've never seen a little guy jump like that before, McMahon said. The 76ers would draft Free in the second round. He would see limited action in his first year, losing a lot of hair on the front part of his scalp because he was so worried about his finances all the time. The 76ers had him hone his skills in the Baker Summer League as some felt Free needed more development. One executive called his style wild and helter-skelter, but Philadelphia's general manager, Pat Williams, felt Free would be a great one. By 1977, Free was a solid contributor on the 76er team, making his presence felt in the playoffs against the Boston Celtics. Story, both teams told. Four point, Philadelphia lead, 10-33 for the half. Make it five, and don't forget, Dr. puts on a move. And a follow-up by Lloyd Free. More pressure today than any day during the season. He's been under the gun all year long with this talent. Here's Free on a turnaround. And Free duels inside, comes back. That great leaping ability, yeah. Billy. Here's Lloyd going up. Now watch him once he hits the floor, getting back in the flow of the game, getting the ball. Two points. 133 left in the first half. Game seven, Philadelphia, Boston from the spectrum. Free. Although I must say, Tommy Heinsohn has been extremely quiet today. He was very quiet in the fifth game here in Philadelphia. Off Dawkins' hands, regains control, and came up with all the play. JoJo lost control. Two on one. Free pressures. White and free goes to the basket. Low pursued it. So did Irving. Back come the 76ers. Dawkins now to free. Free inside. He plays. Got it. And was fouled. Well, we see how much the 76ers. Mix out screening now for free. Throws one up. It's the Lloyd Free Show. I don't know how he does it with those shots. They go up by six. Intercepted by Mix. Off to Free again. Up by eight. Inside of a minute. A six point 76er lead, 30 seconds, third quarter. That's why it's so important driving to the basket. Free misses, and look at him go to the glass. That's just sheer hustle and determination on Lloyd Free's part. Free. No one was out there. Happy either. Billy, see what's happening. Cowens took the lob pass underneath, muscled up, wouldn't go. Everyone's screaming. Countdown begins. It is over. It is all over. 83-77. Look at the crowd here in the oh spectrum. Look at the fans. Free would suffer a partially collapsed lung and a cracked rib during a collision with Mike Newell of the Houston Rockets in the Eastern Conference Finals. Consequently, Free couldn't do anything of significance during the championship series against the Portland Trailblazers as the 76ers would lose. But Free became a fan favorite in Philadelphia, accommodating all autograph seekers because when he was a kid, he was ignored by his hero, Walt Clyde Frazier. I remember going to the garden with my mother and watching the Knicks, Free said. Watching Clyde, we'd sit way up. I mean way up because that's all we could afford. You'd need binoculars to see the players. I remember trying to get autographs afterward and the guys brushing me off. Walt Frazier was among those players a snub Free had never forgotten. By the end of the 1978 season, Free would get significant minutes off the bench. One writer described his talent as, quote, crude and unrefined, 
like an OPEC nation's oil supply. The crowd of opposing teams would chant, shoot, as it was said that free had only one commandment of basketball, thou shall not pass. His consistency seemed to be a problem as he went on a streak where he only shot 41% from the floor and 63% from the free throw line. Angered by the criticisms, Free improved his accuracy in both categories. Guys started kidding me, Free said, calling me the worst free throw shooter they'd ever seen. That made me try harder. Free developed a reputation as a heel, with rumors that he was a chemistry destroyer on teams. His estranged agent, Joseph Jeffries L., stated that coach Gene Shu was under orders to feature George McGinnis and Julius Irving because they sold tickets. So Free was held back. Shu was then fired and replaced by Billy Cunningham. The new coach didn't like Free's game, as Free felt that Dr. J was getting old and that the 76ers offense should now go through him. In 1978, the Sixers lost to the Bullets in the Eastern Conference Finals, with Free taking a lot of the blame. Free would be traded to the San Diego Clippers and be reunited with Gene Shu. The old coach sat him down, telling him that he was going to change his game. Shu wanted Free to be more than the one-on-one -on -one ball player he was. He wanted Free to score 25 to 30 points a game and dish out six or seven assists. In his first season with the Clippers, Free averaged 28.8 points a game with 4.4 assists. There was a conflict between himself and his teammates, particularly new backcourt partner Randy Smith. They eventually learned to work together and the Clippers finished with 43 wins, a bit more than was expected in 1979. Free's reputation as a gunner would extend to opposing teams. The Lakers' public relations department announced a Stop Lloyd Free Night at the Forum. The gimmick was that if the Lakers could hold the high-scoring free under 20 points, everyone in the house would get free tickets. The Lakers would soon realize that there was no stopping free. But would appear to be very short-handed in the rebounding department tonight. Free. Oh, a shot. Now watch Lloyd Free. He's on the inside of Magic Johnson. Ball spins off. He's got it. Fakes. Goes away from the basket. And then drops one in right off the glass. Perfect timing. Jack McKinney's new look. Has it taken away? The lob now to Free. Boom will come with him and Free puts a move on and a chance for the three-pointer. Good play by Lloyd Free. Hicks. Quick's missing on the shot. Knocked back to Lloyd Free in San Diego again with a second chance. Just inside the three-point line. I thought for sure. <laughs> Stolen by Wicks and watch Free go to it. That's 18 points in the first half for Lloyd Free. Now lost control of the pass and the Clippers come right back. Free left alone. Here's Suchai shot from there. Free was held by shot. Here's Free. Gliding in and there was a whistle. Head by one, then go to three now. Jellybean sends it over to Lloyd Free. What a shot. 37 points. And it right waits for Free. Wants to go way out. Drill a tough shot. But as you mentioned, his base up. Markey established against Denver. 43 points for the game. And would you believe not one the three pointers? Here's Lloyd Free. Watch Kareem right in front of him. Right there. And Lloyd at 6 3 says, Come on, 7 2. Kareem, I'm going to take it to you. Put it up, lean into him, and got the basket. Several other NBA teams held unsuccessful stop Lloyd Free nights. They stopped the practice when they were losing money with all the free tickets. And, um, you know, I just tried to come out there and give my all in all, but my all in all wasn't enough that night. So I, I started to take treatments and everything, and people saying it's my contract problems and really trying to make me out to something that I'm not again. But, uh, you know, I'm going to overlook all that, and I'm just going to play the season out. And, you know, if anything happens, it happens. But I'm All right, now, you know, San Diego played a very tough game tonight. It seemed like they came out early in the ball game, good defensive pressure, and they went inside to the big fellows, and, again, the guards got off. What was Gene Chu saying at halftime, particularly when Philadelphia closed? Well, uh, Gene said that, um, you know, what we need to do with Bill and Swin Nate out there uh, is just to get the ball down low. Uh, they were taking full advantage of Darrell and Caldwell down low because they had the foul situation. But I thought Caldwell made a couple of great blocks, you know, himself, but I'm glad they got him out of there. <laughs> yeah, it looked like he got a, a couple of controversial calls and not having them right at the end of the game hurt them. Now let's turn our attention to the playoffs. Now you're very confident 
do you feel as though the San Diego Clippers can edge out Portland for that six and final spot? Well, I feel so. I feel that, uh, you know, the team is starting to gel. We've been in a slump right now, and we've been playing terrible. But right now we're starting to come back and getting the feel of everybody, and Bill is getting back into the feel of things. He's starting now, and, uh, you know, we won. Okay, now what does a five-game, you got a five-game road trip coming up. What does this victory tonight mean for you psychologically? Well, this means a lot to us. It means that, um, you know, a great team like Philadelphia, we, they came in here, and uh, we were flat and got our morale up, and um, we beat them here, and now we're on the road to play Chicago. So this gives us a big lift right now. Free averaged 30 points in the 1979-80 season with the Clippers, the best year of his career, but the team would finish with a losing record. Critics continued calling him a gunner. Brent Musburger said that, quote, Lloyd Free shoots before the national anthem starts. The criticism bothered Free as the coaching staff wanted him to score. Free finished second in scoring average to George Gervin, two years in a row, and he wanted a raise. Clippers owner Irv Levin was in no mood to give an increase in salaries for a losing team. Instead, he traded free to the Golden State Warriors in exchange for Phil Smith and a number one draft choice in 1984. The Bay Area Press parroted the same critiques from other reporters. Art Spander said that free had the reputation of being as selfish with a basketball as the Scrooge was with Christmas bonuses. Free answered all of this by legally changing his name, and he would now be known as World B. Free. I jumped into the air one day and I didn't come down, Free said. That's when it was time to change my name to World. I knew I put a lot of pressure on myself by changing my name. Free's scoring dipped a bit with the Warriors, but he improved on his assists. Still, the Warriors missed the playoffs, and in 1982, Free was traded to the Cleveland Cavaliers in exchange for Ron Brewer. Warriors coach Al Adels said that Brewer looked to be a better fit on the club than Free. Free then joined a Cleveland team that had a record of three wins against 19 losses. The team's offense was restructured around him, but the losing continued. Free's pride suffered, as it had been years that he had been with a winning team. It's tough, Free said. It's like living in the twilight zone. You're out here working hard every game, but it doesn't matter. The last time Free had won a championship was with the Guilford Quakers, and that seemed like ages ago. Guilford had a reunion of their championship squad with everyone returning except Free. Coach Jensen was crushed, calling Free's girlfriend three times, but never getting a call back. My gut feeling is that it might have been that he didn't want to be Lloyd Free again, Jensen said. He wants to be World B Free, and he was afraid that if he came back, people would have called him Lloyd. Free re-signed with Cleveland, turning down an offer from the New York Knicks. The Cavaliers now had new uniforms, a new logo, and a new slogan, Renaissance in Richfield. There was nearly a doubling of season tickets with Free's arrival. Free led the team in scoring, but was snubbed by all-star voting even though he had the stats to back up his inclusion. In the beginning of the 1984-85 season, Free was benched by rookie coach George Carl. Carl was upset that Free did not consistently get back on defense. Now the oldest man on the squad at 32 years of age, Free talked of retirement. Free said he wouldn't make a big announcement so arenas could hold farewell ceremonies for him. I don't think they would do that for me, Free said. I just wasn't one of those kind of guys. You know, I put on a great show, but I don't think they accepted me that way. Free would go on to say that he accepted the fact that he was never a big name. The guy who played at the big college the Final Four, and got big money from the start. But he prided himself on the fact that he had to fight for it all. By March of 1986, Free and George Carl were barely on speaking terms. Cleveland fired Carl, and Free would be let go himself. He returned to the Philadelphia 76ers, but played only 20 games, as he now tipped the scales at nearly 30 pounds over his prime playing weight. The 76ers couldn't wait for him to lose weight. Free was released, played with the Miami Tropics of the United States Basketball League before he signed with the Houston Rockets in 1987. In July of 1988, the Rockets released Free, ending his NBA career at the age of 34. Free continued to work in his community, returning to Brownsville to encourage and mentor youth. He became director of player development and a community ambassador for the Philadelphia 76ers. On March 26, 2022, Free was honored at halftime of a Cavaliers game and given a spot on the Cavaliers Wall of Honor.
He remains one of the more unappreciated stars of the 1980s, a player who could provide instant offense.